read her writing sometimes you know accidentally as a member of an editorial staff and on purpose as her you know friend and fan um i was like well why not you know so many times writers have to pay to submit to like book contests and everything but it's it's free to submit to agents so i think i was um being very blase about it like well you know all someone can do is say is no and, and saying no is free so why not just you know send out and i i couldn't tell if Maisie was taking me seriously or not or what what she might do um and then you know life went on i don't even know if i was living in i guess i was living in new york at that point but you know we got busy and the next thing i heard from Maisie was that her book had been um, accepted for publication by Simon and Schuster. So that was really exciting. Um, and Maisie, I hope uh, you can fill us up in a little bit, like me particularly, because I'm curious what happened between that conversation and the time when you found out your book would be published, um, if you don't mind talking a bit about that. Oh, sure. Um, I think it was earlier, right? Maybe it was 2017 or... Was it okay? I thought, yeah, because it was around the Scholastic Contest. Oh, yeah, yeah, the first year. <laughs> yeah, because I think what happened, actually, my path to getting an agent was kind of unconventional. Um, so somebody that I went to college with was a contributing editor to um, an online uh, feminist newsletter ca called Lenny Letter. And she just asked me if I wanted to pitch the magazine um, essay ideas. And I had never written a personal essay for publication before. Um, so, you know, so I just thought of some idea, like kind of about my family, about my parents actually. And they accepted it. And, you know, I wrote the essay and they published it. And my agent, um, Monica Odom, read the essay. And then she emailed me at the library and just, you know, asked if I had other work. And I said, I had, you know, I have stories. So I showed her those stories and that's actually how I got signed. And then we kind of made a plan to finish the book. Um, you know, and it, it's, it, at the, when I initially started it, it was more of like an interconnected short story collection, but it kind of um, evolved into a novel over the, that year that we spent working on it. So you worked on it from um, like, maybe with your agent for about a year to, to form what it is now. So. Yeah, because it was like, um, I'd been working on it since I graduated, since I started the MFA program right. um, in 2006, I started the MFA program at Brooklyn College. So I'd been working on like half of the book for like, I guess at that point, um, what, like t over 10 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, once I knew, I guess once I had deadlines and I knew that somebody was waiting for it, it you know, I started <laughs> writing faster <laughs> mm -hmm. and I finished it within, you know, within the year. And then actually after it sold, we were like kind of on the fence about whether it was a novel or short story collection. Um, but when I started working with my editor at Simon & Schuster, Christine Pride, then we made a lot of changes to the book and I actually added 30,000 words like after it was sold. So, um, you know, then it became kind of this novel in stories. Yeah. What was it like, because you mentioned that you worked on these stories for, you know, the better part of 10 years. And I think like one of the few things I learned in MFA is that um, everything with writing takes longer than you think it will. Yeah. Um, so what was it like? Maybe many of these stories were, you know, finished, polished, published. Um, and then to go back in and revisit those stories and sort of look at them from another lens or see maybe where they could be expanded, where there was a point of view that you hadn't covered yet. Can you talk a little bit? about what that was like for you, these stories that, you know, many of them you had considered sort of finished, um, what it was like to go back and give them another look and expand on them. Um, you know, I think it, it, it kind of was up and down at first. It was really difficult to, to think of the story expanding. Um, but then I realized like when I began those stories, I felt like I was a different kind of writer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was in my early 20s when I started them and then I was in my late, you know, mid to late 30s when I, um, went back and started revising them. So yeah, I think it, it actually, I think I was a better writer, I, I realized, and it, it, it made it a little more exciting. And then I, you know, I included new characters. I'd learned a lot because the story is, um, you know, set in New York City and in Jamaica. So I'd learned a lot more about Jamaican history and, um, you know, and I wanted to incorporate those things into the novel. Um, so it was exciting. But then I think, you know, when you start going through the entire editorial process, then it's like, it gets a little brutal to like, <laughs> you know, because you're reading over the, the book, you know, 100 times over and over again. So that was mm -hmm. difficult. But yeah, it was, I'm glad 
you know, I had that opportunity. And I'm glad, I'm glad that even though I think when I was at Hunter, like I wanted to be like Carson McCullers and, you know, publish a book in my early 20s. <laughs> um, I'm glad that I didn't publish it in my early 20s. I'm glad. Right. That I, I think that's um, something that maybe especially like first generation college students or things like that, that can affect us because we sort of have bought into and believe in that idea of like the cult of genius. Like if you're really smart, somebody like taps you on the head when you're 16 or 20 or 22 and um, decides that you're, you're allowed to be anointed and have a career. But I mean, like the less glamorous and less exciting truth is that it, it's just a lot of like dogged work alone at your computer yeah. um, for years and years until you like summon up the confidence to say, this is my work, this is what I have, I'm going to put it out there. Um, so I'm glad to hear you uh, talk a bit about that and to be able to admit that, you know, you're a better writer and sure, now with self-publishing, we could all put stuff out when we're 20, 22, 25, but um, having waited sort of makes it a different, a different kind of product, a different kind of um, piece of artwork that, you know, it was worth the wait in my opinion. Um, but going back to Hunter, um, we have a question from one of our, um, people here, did you start out wanting to be a novelist? Um, well, I guess it depends on how far back <laughs> um, they mean, I guess. Um, you know, like I wanted to be a writer when I was in high school. Like I decided in 10th grade, actually Miss Miss Refkin's class, so I see who's here, <laughs> um, you know, when I was in 10th grade. So yeah, I'd been like working towards that ever since, albeit like very slowly. That's great. And you, I remember you took the, um, Mr. Dr. Zegers, the, the creative writing. Yeah. Yeah. The, I, I wasn't able to take that and I was always jealous. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Um, and I think Hunter is great because it allows you to have those electives and sort of peruse those, um, classes that you might want to take, but you didn't have opportunity earlier. One of the things that disappointed me, um, during my brief and unconventional um, trip over to Stuyvesant was they wouldn't let you take two English electives at a time because they said it was padding your average. Whereas oh, really? you know, yeah. for people like us, we probably work hardest in our English classes. Um, when did you decide to be a writer? I'm just curious. I don't think we ever talked about it. Yeah, decided. So I'm an only child. Um, I spent a lot of time reading just for, you know, lack of anything else to do. But I also like really spent a lot of time in front of the television too so I guess like you know I have both like a episodic um view of narrative but also you know on those like summer reading challenges at PS whatever you know I, I would read like 20 books just because why not what else is there to do um so I think I was interested in writing them I would um write little plays that I would like force my cousins to perform in and everything because you know I didn't have anyone else around um but actual books I think I'm going to blame one of my um college friends who sh she um her brother was in at the MFA program in Michigan um and I knew like like me, she was on financial aid. And so when I got to know her a little better, I said, oh, I, you know, I don't want to be rude by like talking about money, but like, how does your brother afford to go to go to grad school for writing? And she was like, oh, they pay him. And I was like, what? You know, like, <laughs> I couldn't imagine a world where somebody might pay you even a little bit to write something. So I blame, I blame her. She's a doctor. Um, she can afford to be whimsical. Uh, my like knowledge that that was even possible. Um, and then probably like in MFA, I think when you go to MFA, because oftentimes you're working in like um, a canon that's sort of, you know, traditionally white and male. Um, I feel like my writing changed as it got like technically better. It also got sort of like sanded down and un -Lori like And so um, I don't know if you're feeling a similar way, but it sort of took me several years outside of MFA to kind of you know, get my own voice back from John Updike and whoever else had been stealing it for all those years. Yeah, I think you kind of expect, um, you ex you kind of are used to being, getting all this like positive reinforcement, I think, like mm -hmm. um, to know that you're good at something. And I think I got that in high school and mm -hmm. then I didn't get it again till, I got it a little like at the end of college when I started writing creative nonfiction. So I, that's why I applied to the MFA program. 
Um, but I feel like I definitely wasn't one of the people who were kind of like the stars of the MFA. Um, right. You know, so I, but at the same time, I still felt compelled to write, even though I didn't think my stories were that good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now in retrospect, I realized that, you know, all the people, some of the people who were the kind of stars kind of gave up, um, you know, once you go out in the world and you don't have that constant, like positive reinforcement. Um, because as you said, writing is kind of lonely. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, especially when you don't feel like anybody's waiting for it. So. Oh, actually, thinking back to if, if it was around like 2017, then I, I probably had recently read um, uh, someone who went to your MFA's like, you know, first book. And I remember thinking like, oh, this is good. But like, Maisy stuff is just as good. Like, why? Like, what's what's the difference between this author's who put their first book out and, you know, Maisy whose book isn't out yet. And, and in my mind, you know, being Macy's friend and champion. I'm, I'm thinking it's just it's just because she hasn't been like, hey, you know, here I am. Here's my work, yet. Um, and I think a lot of times that's that's mainly what it is. Um, that we sort of lack the confidence to think, oh, well, I'm not I'm not the anointed one or one of the favored ones. I didn't win all the fellowships, so yeah. nobody wants to hear from me. But um, that's nonsense. And along those lines, um, another question from the field here. Um, I'm a woman of color writer who deals with imposter syndrome. Did you also deal with that? And how have you learned to overcome it? Um, yeah, I, I've always, <laughs> I've always experienced that. And I think, I don't know, I kind of have said to a couple people that you don't have to, it doesn't matter if you feel confident, you just like, you know, if you're a writer, you just keep writing. Um, I think that's like, you know, that's the kind of hardest thing. I think if you want to embark on it as a lifelong career or whatever, it's like you have to kind of accept that, you know, you might make zero dollars from it or you might make, you know, you might make a living from it, um, but you write anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't really think, I never felt like, I don't like being the center of attention. I've never felt like I was meant for that, but at the same time, I still feel compelled to write. So I think, you know, if you are compelled to write and if you start publishing your work, trying to publish your work, um, you know, I think eventually people take notice of it. Um, mm -hmm. I had started publishing, I think that's when um, I started really having a book was when I just made a decision to start sending out my work, even though, um, you know, I was getting rejections. Like I just kind of made a set goals every mm -hmm. year that I was gonna send out, um, you know, at least one, and I'm a slow writer too, so I would have like one story to send out a year, um, but I would just keep sending it out until it got published. And I, the first story that I sent out, I think it got rejected. I did it in two rounds, but I think it probably got rejected over like 65 times. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, so I just like kept sending it out. And I think once once I got that one story published, I felt like, you know, now I can have another goal. and try to get two stories published and that mm -hmm. kind of just kept me going. I think just having small realistic goals, um, you know, and expanding them as you go along mm -hmm. kind of helps. And so you don't focus on, um, you know, whether you're good enough, just focus on the story, focus on getting the work out. Right, that's a smart way to think about it in terms of like little um, goal posts along the way, because I think um, you mentioned, you know, in high school thinking like, I wanna be Carson McCullers, <laughs> I feel like before you know, I sent out my first story um, for publication. I probably thought like this is the best thing I have, so I'm going to save this, you know, for the yeah. <laughs> like hold on to it until then because obviously they're going to want it. And then you know, two months later, you've written something better. And so um, I think the the fear of the first rejection was actually much much worse than the actual sting. Like once you get the rejection, it's like oh okay, it's like getting a, a shot at the doctor. It's like that wasn't so bad. Let's let's get more. Um, and then I, that's one thing I always talk to my um, creative writing students about. I save that for the last day. I tell them how many stories I've published. Like, I've, you know, I published 10 stories. Guess how many rejections I've received because I keep track of them um, on an Excel spreadsheet. It's probably a very hunter thing to do. Um, and they always guess like eight, 10, and, and I'm like, you know, 600, whatever. And they all like, <laughs> gasp like either I'm the unluckiest person in the world or I'm actually the worst writer or I've shattered something but just to demystify um rejection and being told no it feels so personal because it's something you are working on but at the same time um you know it happens to everybody oh, that's true um somebody asks what is your writing routine like and I'm curious to hear this for myself 
Oh, um, you know, I was, when I was writing the novel, I was working a lot. Like I, I think I had like, I had a full-time job and then I had two, two part-time jobs. So I didn't really have a lot of time. Um, so I would just write, you know, I would just like take a week off, you know, use my vacation days and then I would get a lot of writing done. So I'm kind of like a binge writer. Um, mm -hmm. But right now I have a, another book due. So I took time off uh, or I, I left my job actually uh, to work mm -hmm. on this book. So I have all this time, but it's still very, <laughs> I'm still like kind of binging. Like I don't really have a good routine. Um, I guess I spend, you know, I'll spend usually most of the, the week like researching or reading, um, you know, and then I'll spend like a weekend writing um, but I'm mm -hmm. trying to get more disciplined and better <laughs> at that. You know, I'm glad to hear that because I feel like a lot of people are like, I wake up at five every yeah. day and write for, I feel like they're lying. Like some of them definitely are doing it. Um, but that's, you know, I know too many artists to believe that, that that's how we're all doing it. I, I sort of binge as well too. And I'm like a weird night owl um, when everyone else is asleep and, you know, back in the day before there was television on demand, there was nothing good on TV in the night and the phone wasn't ringing. And so that's when I would like inhabit creativity in this uninterrupted space. But when you work, you know, nine to five, you can't yeah. stay up until three o'clock in the morning writing. But I think also like I would, if, if I would, I like to work in libraries or like cafes mm -hmm. or something and nothing's open right now. So if the lab, I would sometimes, I live near Rutgers Newark. so. I think when I was working on the edits to my book, I would just go there in the morning and stay there, you know, till it closed, but that's not really an option. So I'm kind of trying to, um, I guess the best time for me is like middle of the day, <laughs> like a middle of the day right there. Did you have a, um, besides the Rutgers um, library, a favorite um, coffee shop maybe in the neighborhood that you would go to work on your writing? Um, when I started the book, I lived in Brooklyn. So there were a lot of, I don't think I can't I don't think they're there anymore but um you know there are a lot of coffee shops around my house that I used to go to here when I'm when I moved to Newark there were like there weren't any coffee shops um but they actually built just made two um recently um so now sometimes I'll go to Black Swan Espresso but right now because of the pandemic there's no there's no seating really so I kind of work at home yeah um pandemic I guess this leads into another question um, from the group here. Has the pandemic slash Black Lives Matter slash the election affected your perspective um, on your role as an artist? And if so, how, you know, big question, but approach it however you want. Um, I think I've, I've definitely written a lot more personal essays. I really don't usually like to write them, but I think, um, yeah, like I have written, you know, my grandfather passed away during the pandemic from COVID, so you know, I wrote an essay about that, and um, you know, I've been working, I've been thinking more about like family and um, different topics that I don't necessarily want to incorporate into another novel. So yeah, I think it's just kind of steered me a little more in the direction of creative nonfiction and personal essay writing. Okay. Was there um, a reason that you had focused mainly on fiction um, and not because I'm thinking back to your um, Lenny letter essay too, which um, I read and loved and I love like the, you know, the allusions to sort of like the 14 year old hunter lifestyle. Um, but that's true. I guess when you enter an MFA, it's like pick a genre and then yeah. you can go outside that genre. But um, yeah, is there a reason why you zeroed in on fiction? I think that was just like the first thing like I loved, like I always read, you know, I was always a big reader and I always like to read fiction, um, you know, and the first, time I wrote was, yeah, it was in Ms. Rufkin's class where, you know, we, we were, um, I think we were reading, we read Flannery Connor and we had to, you know, write our own kind of story with a, using a character from that story. So I think, um, you know, that, that just felt good to me and I never really thought about non, I always actually like specifically disliked uh, nonfiction writing. Um, but I think, you know, I think you just have to kind of be initiated into it. So when, when Caitlin Greenidge, who's the writer who has asked me to submit to Lenny Letter, um, you know, pitch, asked me to pitch something. And I actually had the experience of writing, um, writing the essay. And then also I think seeing like how people respond to it. And I think it's a, kind of a different response than fiction. It's like a very personal response and people start, you know, people were messaging me and telling me kind of their own similar stories. And so, you know, I think I do like that conversation that um, creative nonfiction opens up. Mm -hmm. 
on the flip side of that, do you ever um, have people responding to your fiction as if it is nonfiction? I know that sometimes a problem that um, fiction writers have, especially you know if they're working in realist fiction or if um, characters in the book have similar backgrounds to their own. People might read this and think, "Oh, this is all about Maisie's family." Yeah. <laughs> and you know, even if it's inspired, it's there's a lot of creative um, license. So, um, I guess to pair with that too, um, does your family read your work and is that a concern for you? Because I know it's a concern for many of the young writers I teach, but um, maybe they don't even read your work. I think sometimes uh, people overestimate. Yeah, my parents don't read it. They don't read it at all. I'm so lucky. <laughs> um, and I try not to like post any essays uh, where they can read them. But, um, you know, I gave them both a copy of my book and they, they actually, you know, they're very supportive. They send it out. They've like mailed it to the whole family, but they don't, they just don't, they don't really read fiction. So I don't think they'll decide to, to read it. Um, but my brother and my sister have read it and some of my, you know, my aunts and stuff. And, and the response has been pretty positive. Um, I think when your family reads it though, even if it's not about them, I think some people think the characters are based on them. Um, yeah. And because my, you know, like my sister asked me if a character was based on her, even though I started working on it when she was like probably in elementary school. <laughs> um, so there's no way it could be. But, you know, I think a lot of people s see themselves in the book anyway, and there's nothing you could really do about that. Right. I heard like, a, you know, one of these myths that people can see other people in characters, but they can't see themselves. And that's always something like, I hope, fingers crossed, is true in fiction, who knows. Do you write personal essays? I, I know you write fiction too. I have, but I, I've published few of them. I don't, I don't really send them out in the same way. I guess I tend to write like longer pieces too. And so if I'm sending those out individually, not as many places take long pieces, maybe I just need to you know, edit myself <laughs> better, but... Um, yeah, definitely, you know, only child living sort of like socially alone for so long, you sort of ruminate on yourself a lot <laughs> and, and the environment around you. So um, I have written essays, but not, not published too many. Um, I'm curious to go back to the um, Flannery O'Connor assignment. What character did you pick to write from the point of view from? Do you remember? I picked the bus driver. But now, in retrospect, I realized I didn't have a good understanding of history. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, in everything I, that I, rises. I was like, of course, the bus driver's black, yeah. but it's like, it did, you know, if, for people who haven't read that story, it's like, you know, it's set during the when buses were integrated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the the two main characters, um, this guy and his mother, uh, you know, have two. I guess like his mother is kind of old South and, you know, is, doesn't like, is scared of, you know, black people sitting in the front of the bus. And so he kind of wants to antagonize her and he purposely sits next to the black people on the bus. And then, you know, so I wrote a character, wrote a story from the point of view of the, the bus driver and, but I kind of made him black, but I was like, that doesn't really, <laughs> would have been that way. Great story. I would love to read that. Um, our classmate Lena asks, um, who are some of your favorite writers? Um, like definitely Toni Morrison, um, Jamaica Kincaid, uh, this Jamaican writer called uh, Michelle Cliff, um, Alexander Heyman, and I don't know, there are a lot, um, a lot of Caribbean writers, um, Nicole Dennis Ben, Marlon James. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how have your reading taste been affected um, by writing? Okay, let me rephrase that. Uh, when you're like working on your own work or your own novels, um, do you tend to read work that you feel like is stylistically or tonally similar or do you go for totally different things or do you not? You uh, I actually just read the same books over and over again. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm writing a book now that has also has like historical background. So I'm reading like nonfiction for research, but I, mm -hmm. I like when I wrote my last book, I read a lot of books, but I think the ones that stuck out to me more were the most were um, A Mercy by Toni Morrison, like towards the end, and um, this book called No Telephone to Heaven by Michelle Cliff. And later, when I was like finishing it, I read this book called uh, What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky by Leslie Nekarima. So I kind of just like, now that I'm writing another book, I just reread all three of those books. Mm. Um, and I always like kind of reread A Mercy when I don't, when I don't know what to write. 
Right, right. Yeah, I do that too. I revisit books because, I mean, I guess like your own writing, when you revisit something that you read as a 16 or 20 year old, you have a different perspective on it. And likewise, I found that, you know, some books that I loved when I was younger, when I revisit them now, I'm like, oh, oh really? Like what? doesn't speak to me anymore. Um, let's think, what didn't stand out to me? I can't, I'll, I'll keep that in mind, um, but I can't think of something, but those are the ones when, you know, I've had to do one of my many moves. It's like, oh, time for this to go to the goodwill. <laughs> Thank you for your service, etc. cetera. Um, here is a question um, from the group again. Um, if you had any advice for your younger self slash other young artists looking to be professional artists, what might it be? Um, you know, I think in retrospect, we, we got, I had a lot of, lot more opportunity than I realized. Like, I think, you know, we did that internship, um, I can't, like, I can't really remember all these details, but I remember, like, I think I was interning with, like, a literary agent, um, you know, I think, I can't remember what year, that maybe it was our senior year, mm -hmm. um, and I think she had offered to give me a job after, and I could stay on, but I didn't. Um, but obviously that would have been a, <laughs> a good opportunity, but I just didn't like think about that back then. Sure. How interesting. So that, that would have given you like a really valuable, I feel like probably most of your MFA classmates didn't have a perspective of, you know, what it's like to be an agent and to look at the slush pile and everything. Yeah. And we got that experience in high school, which I realize now is like, so, yeah, unheard of. Yeah, my ICY, ICY project, right. Um, I, Rena and I, we worked at, um, Bantam. And I remember oh, really? we were reading like nonfiction books and I was reading like bodice rip or romance. Oh, really? It was great. It was so, it was wonderful. It was, yeah, a really yeah. great internship. Yeah, I think my advice would be like, you know, just be aware of like the, I guess the connections and the opportunities that you have and like kind of foster relationships. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because I think I'm just like kind of naturally quiet. Um, and I just didn't really think about keeping in touch with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that would have been valuable, um, especially like post-college. Um, but I think also just, uh, you know, just like share your work with people. I think that made a big difference. Um, I think after, I think when I went to the MFA program, it's not that I felt like my work was flattened or, you know, that they were pushing me. Well, actually, no, you're right. At some point I did feel that way. Um, but that wasn't even like my biggest issue. I think I just felt, um, I felt, I just felt isolated for some reason. And I think, but you know, I, so in my last year I cut down to part-time and I joined my roommate at the time's like writing group. And, you know, that was actually like, that just felt like more welcoming to me. Um, and, you know, that, and I actually kept meeting with that group till, till recently. Um, like, you know, the dynamics shifted over the years, but you know, we kept meeting and I feel like that group has helped me um, stay motivated over time. So I think, yeah, it's like find a supportive group, find people that you could share your work with and eventually I think send out your work because I didn't, I think I didn't start sending out my, I finished in 2009, I guess, but I didn't send out my first story until 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I was, yeah, I was just feeling like it wasn't good enough, but, um, you know, mm -hmm. once I started doing that, it really opened things up too. Mm -hmm. And that's, yeah, that's something I think just having, um, worked as an you know, editor for a literary magazine when people say like how come you know magazines are like mostly publishing like men or white men or something I'm thinking back this is about like 12 years ago to my own time um, as an editor when we would solicit writers often you know we would solicit a wide variety of writers and it was often like you know the guys who would write back right away like here here's a story and then you know the women sometimes would be like well, I don't know if I have anything. And it's like, I know, I know you have something like you think it's not good enough, but I know it's good enough. Please just send it to me. Um, so I think there's a lot of uh, benefit in that, like going back to our younger selves or lesser developed selves and thinking, you know, you're, you're good enough. Even if you're not as good as you want to yeah. be, you're good enough now. And um, yeah. So I think when, when Caitlin had asked me to pitch that essay, I, you know, I was in my thirties, but I probably, if she had asked me when I was 23, I probably would have said, you know, I don't write non nonfiction right now. I don't have anything and I would have let it pass, but I was older so I could take advantage of it. 
Yes, that's good. And why not you, right? <laughs> why not me? That's a good thing to ask ourselves. Um, back to the question document. Okay. Um, here is another question. Again, this, you know, might be broad, but I think it's um, important. Uh, the writer says, how did her time as a student of color immersed in the culture of Hunter College High School impact her life, her career, or aspirations? Um, so again, another big question, but however you want to talk about that. Um, I think, you know, I think, you know, for, uh, on the one hand, like, you know, I got a lot of benefits from it. You know, I was, I was from a school in a low income community. Um, you know, my parents were immigrants. Um, so there are a lot of, like, I don't think I would have gone in a creative direction. Like, you know, I kind of just, I don't know. I mean, I think, I, I think I had, you know, I had a, a mentality that a lot of like, you know, children of working class immigrants have, you know, I just wanted to, you know, we were, we came to this country so that I could go to school and get a good job. And I think my mom told me to be like a, she told me to like be a physical therapist and I just like I had no interest in like medicine but I was like okay <laughs> you know <laughs> so I think I in my mind I was just gonna like go to Hunter College and you know be a physical therapist and just do what my mom told me but mm -hmm. I think um and also I didn't know anything about college uh you know because my you know my parents didn't go to college so I, it wasn't like I came to Hunter like wanting to get into Harvard like I didn't I didn't even think about that um but I think you know towards it was weird. I think it was towards my last, the last two years when, you know, we started to think about college, like all of a sudden I realized that I could, I could, I have all these choices, um, you know, and I think I wouldn't have, my world probably wouldn't have opened up that way if I hadn't gone to Hunter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we also, you know, obviously I had the advantage. Yeah, like we didn't take any Regents exams, um, you know, and I think that that definitely impacts your education. Like I, I after I graduated from college, I worked at um, a couple of high schools in in Manhattan um, that had populations that were, you know, mostly Black and Latino teens. And, you know, I kind of, I was like, I, I mean, I should have known, but I was like shocked at the difference in experiences. You know, I think we had so much freedom um, at Hunter. And when I, you know, when I went to these schools, I was just shocked at how, um, how like the institutional feel you know like you know um and kind of the aggression that i think um some of the staff had toward the kids um you know so i think i just you know i just i i just realized i had like a very different educational experience than a lot of than i would have if i had gone to my like zone school um and you know i think it it definitely impacted me wanting to become a writer i don't i don't think i would have become a writer to be honest if i um hadn't gone to hunter i don't think i would have um, but at the same time, I think a couple, well, and, and so, and the interesting about going to Hunter too, is that, you know, obviously there weren't a lot of black kids when I went there and it was like coming from a neighborhood in New York city where it's predominantly like black and Latino and my neighborhood is very South Asian too. Um, you know, it was kind of like a culture shock, um, that the demographics shifted so drastically. Um, so I kind of experienced this like feeling of like isolation my first couple of years, um, you know, but obviously I made friends and I got comfortable in the school as time went on. But I think, you know, after, after graduating, going to a, you know, a PWI, like going to Wesleyan, um, you know, I, I saw that other students who had come from my, my neighborhood um, were having that culture shock in college like all of a sudden being minorities where they didn't, when they didn't grow up that way. And I felt like I didn't have that kind of anxiety because I had already experienced it when I was like a kid. Um, so I think, you know, I could focus on other things when I was in college, whereas some people really struggled with it. Um, so I guess that's kind of a, you know, a benefit. Um, I think that, ends, does that answer the question? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. The the, the sheer like rigor of Hunter too, as a, a first generation student for me, um, when I got to college and, you know, my roommate would cry because she got an A minus. I was like, an A minus is a good grade. Like, yeah. <laughs> high school. I mean, you know. Yeah. I think it's also <laughs> like, yeah, it's like we went to a school that it felt like so competitive. Um, and I think getting into college was so competitive, but once you got in it, it, you know, it was a different experience. Like it was a positive experience I didn't feel like I was competing against my classmates so that was like a positive 
aspect of Hunter? I didn't do many um, arts sort of, or like writing arts um, related things at Hunter, but I mean, I think if you were to ask like a student of our era, you know, is Hunter competitive? They would say like, definitely. But did you feel like the, I'm just curious, the like art scene was, had that kind of competitive spirit or, or was that missing or did it feel different, you know? Um, I can't remember because I, well, I feel like I was not the person, I think I felt like Hunter felt very outgoing to me. I don't know if it felt that way to you. It's like a shy person. It was like, <laughs> sometimes yeah. it was terrifying <laughs> in that way because everybody was like, it felt like a lot of people had big personalities. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, I wasn't like a, so I never like, tr I never wanted to like do theater or, um, yeah, I didn't think of myself as an artist and I didn't think I was capable of doing anything creative at all, I think until, um, you know, until I decided I wanted to be a writer. Um, yeah, like it just never occurred to me to, to, to do any, to want to do anything like creative or have like that kind of job. I remember Maura McTagg and I like wrote a play though for Brick Prison once, but it wasn't, it wasn't accepted, but that was like my only, tr I think, try to. Dust it off and you know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know why I didn't like engage in like writing, probably, you know, for similar reasons. I thought like, oh, okay, I'm not one of the people who's super confident in this. And so I'm probably not as good, which, you know, it's a, a bad. Um, also, I feel like my, you know, like I have immigrant parents and it's like, I couldn't do, they didn't want me to stay late ever. So I had to go home. So yeah. I could really do like well, many extra. You know, it was a long commute too. Like if you stayed yeah. to five at home, you would get home like maybe at eight. Like it was just. Yeah. It was long and tiring. I remember that. Yeah, like all the Queens people had to. Leave <laughs> right. Exactly. Your friendships were formed on like the E train on the way home. Yeah. Um, something I've been thinking about um, for a while now is how, though obviously students, uh, Hunter's student body is not majority, you know, POC by any standards. Um, the opposite is kind of true for our alums who are um, sort of most celebrated in the arts. And obviously we have, you know, um, recent alums like Robert Lopez or Lynn who are very celebrated, but even going back, we have um, like the actor Ruby D and um, the writer Audre Lorde, um, Manette Louie who has a um, event with the Alumni Association coming up, um, Olivia Cole, the editor, Chris Jackson, who's at um, One World Books. I was impressed to learn a few years ago that he was a, a Hunter alum too. And I liked reading about his um, experience with his ICY project, I guess that helped him get into editorial. Um, and so I was just wondering, I'd like to ask um, if you think there's something Hunter does or could be doing more of to foster, I guess, the artistic development um, or opportunities for its POC students, if you'd be interested in talking about that a bit. Um, you know, I think, I think what makes a difference, obviously, are, you know, the teachers, all the teachers were really amazing when we were there. Um, and yeah, I think we were just exposed. I just felt like I was exposed to so much um, that I wouldn't have been exposed to otherwise. Um, but I also feel like, yeah, I just feel like to get, to get into Hunter was, it just felt like I had to jump through so many hoops. And I feel like a lot of kids, like if you're from you know, if you're from a school in a low income neighborhood, if you're from a predominantly um, POC school, they might've had the same experience. Like we don't have the same information networks. So I didn't know about Hunter. Like I didn't, I'd never heard of it. Um, and it just felt like, like my teacher told me about it. And then I was here, like taking the train for an hour <laughs> and a half all of a sudden. Um, and it was just like a big culture shock. And I, I, honestly, I don't think I would have ever gone if my teacher like kind of made it her mission to like tell my mother and have us take the test. And then she tutored me. She was like very pregnant and she stayed after school and tutored me for three wow. months, three weeks before the test to prepare me. Um, and I think me and one other boy got in and we were like the only people to get in in like the history of, or as long as the teachers that we had had been there. So it was such a big deal. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's the, the, the knowledge or the information about Hunter is not disseminate, disseminating equally um, so I think a lot of people don't take the test. A lot of POC don't, uh, don't apply. Um, you know, so I think, you know, they don't have the same opportunities as other people. Um, you know, so I think that would bring more, more people in. I, 
I mean, I don't really know, like, if there's, I, I, you know, I've read the articles about, like, how to, you know, people talking about this, but I don't really know, you know, how to get more people to take the test, if there's a way to make it automatic. But, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, but I, at the same time, you know, I wish that, just having worked in other schools in New York City, I just wish that there was a way to bring Hunter into <laughs> other schools and have just have all schools feel like this, but uh, you know, that's obviously a larger issue. Yeah, yeah, that's a very um, heated issue, I know, in, in like Queens anyway, about the, you know, sort of fairness of these admission tests and who, um, I guess it's mostly focused towards the like, you know, specialized science or public schools, but yeah, if people don't know about Hunter, even if they're, you know, excelling academically, they might wind up at Stuyvesant where they can't even take two English classes at the same time because they'd be padding their averages and then you know yeah. what happens to their creative development then. Yeah, I mean, um, I feel like also if you're, yeah, just to get, so when, if you do hear about it and you do take the test and you do get in, um, you know, I just feel like you, like for me, it feels like you've jumped through so many hoops. You feel like, you know, you're kind of like bionic, like you learn to have those kind of skills to kind of like overcome obstacles for the rest of your life. Um, you know, or you kind of have to realize that you have to like plan ahead and like kind of work harder to understand like what opportunities are out there. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's complicated. I don't know. Interesting. I, I don't know how I, I can't remember how I heard about the hunter test, but I do remember asking my sixth grade teacher about it just, you know, or, or I guess we learned that there were some of us that were based on our like scores, we were able to take the test. And I remember asking her if there was anything I could do to prepare for the test. And she said to me, oh, don't worry, nobody gets in. <laughs> I was really hurt by that, even though I was only 12. I was like, well, what if I said nobody gets in? Like, I thought you thought I was smart. You think I can't do this? Um, but yeah, I, I guess that fear too, oh my gosh, I get to take a test and I, I could fail. That means I'm not smart. No, it just means like you didn't practice to take this specific test that has specific questions. And if you take, you know, 18 practice tests, then you'll figure out how to do it and sort of, and anyone can do this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think also uh, what fosters creativity too, is just like the school being in Manhattan and like, you know, that opens up a lot of like free culture. Um, you know, we had like free passes to the MoMA and like, you know, things that I know I would have never d have done, um, you know, if I hadn't gone to Hunter. Mm -hmm. Okay, one um, new question, I guess, that came in while we were talking. Um, and this to me is an easy question. So if Maisie, if you don't want to answer it, I can um, certainly take it on. How are you so fabulous? <laughs> you can take it on. <laughs> <laughs> Maisie, you are fabulous. Yeah, it's, I, I think not to label you an introvert, I feel like I was sort of shy too, um, you know, like growing up or and Hunter kind of introverted myself. I feel like extroverted people, they might, you know, more easily go into arts careers where you're sort of performing and, and the more introverted yeah. might, you know, sort of be writing or creating from behind an easel or a, um, you know, a computer. But so many writers are introverted. And I feel like it, if you can't get over those hurdles to know, well, okay, you know, I'm very shy and quiet and maybe nobody wants to hear what I have to say, but I have to at least um, jump through that last hoop to get somebody, you know, to look at my work than I deserve to be out there. Because if we only heard from people who were really eager to have their voices heard, that would, you know, be a very small and um, not representative slice of the, um, of the artistic community, I think. Um, and you guys, did you want to open up, uh, any questions from our sure. audience at large here? I was going to give you one more minute, but sure. <laughs> okay, Ms. Rapkin, go ahead. Okay, you can call me Lois, it's okay, we're all adults. <laughs> <laughs> so Maisie, your book is amazing. It's beautiful. Oh, and I, I have to say that first chapter, after I read that, I could not put the book down. It was, it was phenomenal. Um, and all the different the different styles you use, it's it's a really it's a tour de force. Um, so I'm eager to hear about your next book. Can you tell us a little bit about it? A great question. Um, it's I'm a little behind on that, <laughs> but uh, you know it's uh, 
I think it's 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 similar style in that it has a lot of different voices. It's um, it's set in Florida in a retirement community, um, and it's a group of immigrant women who are trying to like immigrant home health aides who are trying to organize um, a strike in a in a in a wealthy retirement community. Okay. Is it going to be like interlocked uh, stories the way this book is? Um, no, I'm trying At to make the it moment. more, yeah, I'm trying to make it more like conventional. It's going to be, I mean, there'll definitely be, you know, alternate, alternating, um, POVs in the chapters, but it's, it's going to be like more of a traditional, traditional novel. Okay. Great. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Good to see you. <laughs> oh yeah, you can also put um, questions in the chat so you can see them. Um, I was just saying that if anyone has a question, you could either put it in the chat or there's a reaction uh, function where you could um, raise your hands and Julia, you're next, or you can also raise your hand in the participant panel, but Julia, go ahead. Excellent. Um, hi, Maisie. Hi, Lori. Um, <laughs> Maisie, so I'm a fiction editor at Agni, and Maisie, I have to thank you for that job. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, because one of the one of the pieces that really put Agni on my radar was your story that appeared there. Oh. And that's, you know, when I read that, which I believe is a chapter from, um, yeah, from your novel, that's the first chapter. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, then Agni was on my was on my radar. So that's how I knew that they were asking for editor applications. Is, oh, okay. you know, so I directly attribute my job there to you. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but also, you know, I wanted to, to hear a little bit more from you about your, you talked a little bit about your writing schedule, but also like, what's your process like now that you have the time to work on your novel? You've got people waiting for it. You've got your schedule. Do you, um, do you write every day? Do you have a group of first readers? And, you know, are those folks from your MFA, other folks? Um, and what does the process look like now for you? Do you feel the pressure now that, you know, you, you're kind of thinking about schedules and maybe looking at the clock? So what is, what is writing like now for you post your first novel coming out and, and, and getting such high acclaim? Um, it's, yeah, I definitely feel the pressure. It's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think, I don't know. I mean, I think it's, I was still like, I like, I don't know. I sometimes say in interviews that I feel like when I started that book, I didn't know how to write at all. Like, you know, and I feel like I have more of a sense of like what, how to build a character now. And it's, it feels a little more intuitive. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think I just, I'm kind of like a sloppy, messy first draft person. So I just have been just writing all the way through, um, you know, as, through each draft as far as I can get. And then I just start over. Um, you know, from the beginning and do it, do it again. So I'm on my like third draft right now of the book. Um, but if, you know, it still feels very like rough. Um, but yeah, I think, I think when I wrote my first book, I spent, I wasted a lot of time doing like very deep research and I kind of feel more balanced now between writing and researching. Um, I don't like, I'm not, I'm trying not to like procrastinate as much by doing research. But at the same time, this book does have historical elements in it too. Um, but yeah, there's not really, um, I guess, a method. I guess I just kind of keep trying to write drafts until I feel connected to the characters, until they feel like, um, you know, they're people that I, I want to stick with. So I think, yeah, I think this first draft, I'm like a kind of trying to figure out the trajectory of the plot. Um, and then I'm also trying to figure out which characters I want to like really follow and which characters I want to cut. So, um, you know, I've kind of been adding and cutting um, characters with, with every draft, but you know, I'm, I'm kind of a mess. I don't know. I'm not like, <laughs> I'm not as like structured, but I do, I do like, I think it's funny in the, I think in the MFA, in the MFA, we didn't really like um, learn a lot about plot and structure. Um, so it, I feel like ever since, 
and I started this when I was editing my first book. I feel like I started buying those like writer's manuals, like writer's digest, like how to construct a, you know, um, and I find those very helpful. Like I'll, I'll read those and kind of just like, cause I like the way that they pinpoint one element of the book to focus on. And then I'll just kind of work on that um, for a while. But, you know, I, I think it's, I think I interviewed Britt Brit Bennett and she, um, one thing she said was just that like every book requires something different of you, no matter, you know, no matter how many books you write. So I think this, the process just feels like totally different and I'm trying to kind of figure out, figure it out um, as I go along. Cause I think when I wrote the first book, um, it kept evolving. I didn't really know what the plot was when I started it. Um, but this, this book, I know what it is. Um, and it's, so it's, it's, the focus is not on that. It's just more about like, you know, um, figuring out which, it's more character driven this time around, I would say. And are your first readers people that you knew from your MFA or people that you've met since then? Um, no, actually, I feel like now I only have two first readers, uh, just because I had a writing group and everybody like moved or, you know, they have a family and they're very busy. Um, so yeah, my, my, you know, I, I said I joined my, my roommate's writing group. So my first reader is my old roommate, um, who still lives in Brooklyn. She always reads, um, and one college friend. Um, but yeah, I don't really, I keep in touch with some people from my MFA, but I don't really, we don't really exchange work. Thank you. You're welcome. Maisie, what time period is your um, novel book that you're working on in? It's set in the present day, I guess like a little pre-pandemic, but um, um, it's kind of like about labor, you know, um, so one of the characters is, is one of the residents of the retirement home and um, uh, her like story, I, she used to be like a, you know, a migrant laborer. So she's, I think it goes back to like the 50s, 60s in some periods. Oh. Interesting. Are there other questions? Panelists? Quickly, if you wanna, so Maisie, I did, I was able to go to Maisie's um, book launch in Brooklyn. Um, Maisie had several other events lined up. Were they all canceled by the pandemic, Maisie? So yeah. I, I remember being like so, relieved that you were able to have that launch yeah. you could buy a physical copy of your book and have you sign it but also like so sad for you and other like people whose debut books have come out in that time and who you know haven't been able to do things like go on tours and meet readers in person um so yeah how how did you sort of work around that did you do a lot of these Zoom events or? Um, yeah I've been doing a lot of Zoom events I think um especially at the beginning of the pandemic when everybody was you know, originally went into their homes, like people started to kind of create these like online reading series to kind of entertain people. So I got like a lot of, um, you know, requests to do events, um, you know, and I think, I think when the book tour was scheduled, maybe there were like 10, maybe 10 or 11 events planned. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, because there are no, you know, ge geographic limitations now, I think I, you know, I get invited to a lot of things and I, you know, I'm able to like zoom into people's book groups. So I've probably done like 40, like 40 events um, this year. So that's great. Um, yeah, I don't really know. Like, I, I'm glad that we had that, you know, the first two events, at least, because I know a lot of writers who didn't even get to do that. But I think, yeah. I think, you know, there are pluses and minuses. I think the level of accessibility um, that Zoom has kind of opened up, like, I think it's good. And I hope it stays beyond um, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do want to stay in a hotel and take an airplane and go places. <laughs> <laughs> I want that for you too. <laughs> so if anyone um, hasn't had a chance to buy Maisie's book yet, even if you know you have a full bookshelf and you think I have no time to read, I will uh, tell you as an advocate of writers, um, it doesn't matter, buy it anyway, preferably from your favorite local bookstore um, because you know we're not, or not um, people who like, you know, make art and then we sell one painting. We have a, we have a book and we hope for people to um, patronize us by buying our ideas in a nicely bound package. And Maisie's book is a particularly um, nice package and a very good read. So you might, you might think you have no time to read, but you might get sucked in like um, many of us did. Yeah, and the paperback is actually coming out on um, January 5th. Oh, great. Okay. Excellent. Any paperback events scheduled? 
Put it back on. Uh, not yet. Okay. I'll keep us posted. Yep. I don't think anyone dares to schedule any events. Yeah. <laughs> Other than Zoom, which is here to stay, as you mentioned. And I just actually put into the chat our link to our upcoming events because we do have a lot of other um, Zoom events. And as, as Laura was saying, the benefit of it is that we can have presenters and interviewers from all over the yeah. country and the world, as Lori herself is not in this physical neighborhood. I'm just saying it's mm -hmm. amazing that this um, pandemic gave us this possibility of bringing people together and I'm working with someone who's in Holland and where we have um, um, several events where people are all over the country. So uh, please check out our upcoming events and join us for our events as well. And if there are no more questions, I would love to extend our thanks again to Maisie and Laurie. Thank you so very much and everyone who came to this fabulous event. And yes, an applause for everyone, uh, for you guys. Thank you so much for spending your time with us and have for a fabulous uh, conversation and looking forward to finishing the book, which I'm currently reading. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.